Jitendra and Dr. Yogesh Shukla. So, uh, uh, just a basic uh, rules like uh, I welcome all the presenters and I wish them all the best. Uh, each uh, presentation is six minutes, and uh, I mean, uh, whoever is the presenting author now, it cannot be changed anymore. Okay, so I think uh, can we start if all the time? Okay, just a couple of minutes. Uh, there are due to some preoccupations of some of the presenters there is slight change in the uh, the sequence of presentations so uh, the first presentation is by uh, dr kiran deep okay yourself okay so you have 6 minutes so dr kiran deep good afternoon one and all present so i'll be my topic of presentation is uh, the knowledge attitude and practice patterns related to digital eye strain among parents of children attending online classes the study was done in the COVID era. So we have no conflicts of interest or financial disclosures to make. We all know that COVID-19 has fueled the screen dependency among children and youngsters and worldwide efforts are being made to control the boon of screen related side effects. So the lifestyles have changed dramatically. Working, learning and recreation has moved to a virtual environment and education has changed from classroom to more of personal computers and smartphones. This has raised concerns related to myopia progression, dry eyes and digital eye strain. The objective of our study was to analyze the knowledge, attitude and practice patterns related to digital device usage among parents. We wanted to calculate the digital eye strain prevalence in our study cohort and also to find out the association between parents occupation and refractive error among children. Study was done in a prospective manner over a course of two months in which 305 parents were questioned. So the inclusion criteria was parents of children attending online classes and those who consented to participate. Children presenting with any acute condition or pain and those not accompanied by parents were excluded from the study. So the parameters analyzed were general information, demographics and a CAP questionnaire was conducted. Each of the CAP question was given a score of 2 to 5 based on the responses. Prior ethical approval was obtained from the IRB. So we included a total of 305 parents. The, uh, there was almost equal representation from both the genders. Most of the students belonged to standard 10, uh, 6 to 10 followed by 2nd to 5th standard. And history of spectacle wear was already present in 49% of the study population. So the most common reason for digital device usage stated was online classes, which was followed distantly by WhatsApp, video games, YouTube, and Facebook. The most common digital device usage among parents, uh, among the children was the smartphones, which was followed distantly again by laptops, tablets, smartphones, and desktops were the least commonly used by children. The knowledge questions included the hours uh, children um, can daily spend on digital devices and to understand the importance of sitting at correct distance, particular posture, room lighting conditions, the need for taking frequent breaks, taking dr uh, liquid drinks in between and the risk of getting glasses or dry eyes if it was related to screen time. So we found the mean knowledge score to be 48.5 out of 65. The attitude questions were based upon if parents felt like online classes are a good way to continue the education or as an alternative for evening classes or beyond even beyond the academic purposes. And if they felt spending time with child can decrease their dependency on screens. So the mean attitude score was 26.7 out of 35. The practice questions were how many hours children were actually spending on screens, if they were taking frequent breaks, sitting in correct posture, if parents were making sure to adjust the screen parameters about the sleep pattern of the children and if they were spending quality time with each other. The practice scores was 17.8 out of 30. This 88% of the parents uh, agreed that their daily exposure has to be limited to less than 4 hours and 68% of children were following the same. 82% of parents knew the importance of correct posture and screen distance and 72% of their children were following the same. 86% knew the importance of taking frequent breaks and 74% of the children were taking breaks correctly. Thus, we found a close association between the knowledge of parents and the practice patterns followed by their children. The prevalence of digital eye strain in our study was found to be 64.6%. Abdulkar et al. during the study during the COVID-19 lockdown, they found it as, as high as 78%. It is alarming when we compare with the pre-COVID prevalences of 22.3 to 39.8% which have been reported prior to the uh, COVID era. The most common complaints in our uh, study cohort was headache followed by eye pain and redness. Coming to the association between the parental occupation and refractive error, 54% of the parents were employees and 31% were businessmen. In both these groups, there was a, um, already a refractive error prevalence of 48.71% among these children. 26 parents were farmers and the prevalence of refractive error was 27% in this group. And 7 parents were doctors and the prevalence of refractive error among their children was as high as 72%. 
So our results were uh, following uh, in association with the Comet uh, results, wherein they found that children with uh, of parents with white collar jobs had significantly higher myopia as compared to children of parents in blue collar jobs. 80% of the parents in our study, they were concerned about disturbed parent-child relationship due to increased uh, device dependency. Another study done by Ronald et al. among 1,300 adolescents, they found that the time spent on digital devices inversely correlates to the time children spend with their parents. A survey done by HBSC also found that increased screen time is associated with reduction in health indicators like the physical health status and the mental status of the children. Thus, we know that e-learning has now been chosen as a platform for continuing education. There is an exponential increase in screen time worldwide with children and youngsters leading the game. The present era of digitalization has raised concerns over digital eye strain and myopia pandemics in the near future. The strengths of our study include, this is the first study which has evaluated the knowledge, attitude and practice among pattern, uh, parents related to digital eye strain. And we believe the results from our study can be helpful in implementing correct strategies to prevent these pandemics in near future. The limitations include most of the answers were given by recall bias and uh, higher incidence of digital eye could be related to the hospital setting. To conclude, increased screen time post lockdown is inevitable. There is a large knowledge gap that presently exists in among parents and we need to focus on sc uh, teaching screen ergonomics to parents which can improve practice pattern among children. And parents with white collar jobs need to be really careful as their children are at increased risk of myopia and digital eye in the near future. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Kirandeep. Uh, nice presentation and nice study. Just one question from my side. Uh, can this data be extrapolated for myopia management? Because myopia management is becoming a hot topic in pediatric ophthalm. So, so your sir, results. Uh, these results are really important because we are trying multiple things. Like uh, there are studies which say that outdoor activities and a decreased indoor activity, uh, I mean, as we decrease the near work and increase the outdoor activities, all these things are helpful. But before going into all these things, it is important. Are the parents aware that what things are helpful or not? We are talking about even like the recent advances are going for scleral collagen uh, cross-linking until that level. But we have to work at a very basic level. Do the parents have the basic knowledge of how the myopia can be prevented, the basic things which are proven beneficial? So that way, I think this study is going to be helpful because what we found, there was a very close association between the parents' knowledge and then what actually the children are doing. Because children can't be expected to have knowledge about all these things. We need to target the parents. I'm asking, did you do a comparison study between the uh, rural and the urban population? Like you said, some uh, percentage of farmers' uh, children were there and white color job also. Did you find any difference between the cap, between this two uh, group? Ma'am, uh, the study was done at, like uh, in a uh, tertiary hospital where the most of the population is rural only, ma'am. So, so you are we saying have like uh, only approximately like say 10 to 15 percent of the parents who belong to urban population okay so i think that was mostly like what we found the doctors and so so that also is something should be taken into Which account because they will have a very good knowledge about the thing but how much they are also helping or they are doing to very prevent very their well. children that is also something which has to be taken into and account even the environmental factors I think yeah. for them it is going to be different yes so that, so that is also a very important if you have would have compared those that true, true. Uh, data would have been given okay that is nice presentation idea. thank you ma'am now you invite dr fatima uh, because she has some other uh, the, the first paper was already published no. in IGO, no the first paper which was presented was published in IGO. or jepos First one is yet to happen. Kiran, Kiran ka was published in JPOS. Yes. Uh, Dr. Leela ma'am has to leave for uh, the inaugural. So I think we'll request her to. Unka last Thank you for that uh, re rescheduling. Thank you. Yes. So, preoperative corneal haze in pediatric cataract, is it predictive of development of secondary glaucoma? 
So, FAK or pseudo-FAK glaucoma is a vision-threatening complication of congenital cataract surgery, usually an open angle type which can occur la years later in FAK or pseudo-FAK eyes. And a closed angle one may occur soon after surgery. The very factors like rubella which produces cataract can cause glaucoma as well. And known predictive factors in developing glaucoma after congenital cataract surgery are microphthalmia, early surgery before three months of birth, PHPV infections like rubella and cytomegalovirus. And uh, central corneal thickness has been found to be high among FAK children. Wang et al. in their study showed that central corneal thickness has a predictive value in the development of glaucoma. So our purpose was to analyze the association of corneal haze before congenital cataract surgery to the development of secondary glaucoma. Uh, this was a retrospective analysis among 36 children of 23 children who had cataract surgery before 5 months of age during the period from 2018 to 2021 in Comtrust Eye Hospital in South India. A detailed dilated slit lamp examination noting an abnormality of anterior segment, fundus examination when possible and B-scan was done uh, in total cataract. All had pediatric evaluation to rule out other associations and torch titer was done for all. Under anesthesia, slit lamp examination, corneal diameter, axial length with A-scan, keratometry with handled keratometer and IOP with Perkins was done. Selected children with unilateral cataract and corneal diameter above 10.5 mm and axial length above 19 mm had IOP implantation. All bilateral cases were left FAQ and ECC, the procedure, uh, ECC was done through two 1mm side ports, anterior capsulotomy micro with micro forceps under high molecular weight viscoelastic lens aspiration, polishing, primary P PPC with the help of trip and blue and a shallow anterior vitrectomy with tricot assisted with or without IOL and suturing of the side ports with vicryl. Postoperative steroid antibiotic topically was given for 6 weeks to 2 months, homotropin for 1 to 2 weeks. They were followed up one week, one month, two months and every three monthly thereafter. Uh, FAK correction was given from day 1 to day 7 onwards. Contact lens was given to suitable unilateral cases and patching at least for one hour instituted in unilateral cases from day 1. During follow-up visits, retinoscopy, fundus examination and Perkins IOP whenever possible and slit lamp examination was done. Those who showed a myopic shift of refraction or whom we suspected glaucoma, EUA was examination under anesthesia was done to rule out glaucoma. And intraocular pressure, corneal diameter, axial length, goniometry and CCT were done. Third, there were 36 uh, eyes of 23 children, 14 girls and 9 boys uh, who had surgery before 5 months of age. Uh, 13 children had bilateral cataract and 10 were unilateral. The mean age at the time of surgery was 87.7 days in bilateral cases uh, uh, ranging from 66 to 150 days and 57.7 ranging from 48 to 90 days. 3 unilateral cataracts had IOL implantation. All others, 33 eyes were left FAQ. Seven eyes among unilateral cases had microphthalmia. Two uh, children with bilateral cataract had microphthalmia with corneal diameter less than 9 millimeters and uh, microphthalmia was seen in 70% of the unilateral cases. Six eyes, four unilateral and one pair of bilateral microphthalmic eyes showed corneal haze before surgery and four children had rubella titer for IgG which was high and I, uh, one had CMV titer for IgG and IgM titers which was which were high. Mean preoperative IOP was 16 millimeters and three eyes had membranectomy following surgery. Two of them had IOL implanted. Uh, during follow-up, five children developed ocular hypertension. None of them had a second procedure. Four were unilateral and one, one eye of a bilateral cataract and one was rubella positive. The earliest post-op period of detecting a high IOP was 3 months following surgery and the latest was 20 months. The mean CCT in FAQ case was 613 microns post-operatively among 20 children who had EUA. On analysis, it was found that corneal haze was documented in 4 of the 5 cases diagnosed with glaucoma. That is 80% of these glaucomatocytes. All 4 had corneal haze uh, and their CCT was above 640 microns post-operatively, but their pre-operative CCT was not taken. After a course of timolol, malleate and dorsalamide, all had 5 had to be taken up for surgery. 2 had trabeculectomy with mitomycin and 3 had Ahmad valve drainage procedure. I IOP uh, is controlled by surgery in three and two are being followed up with timolol. 
so uh, wong et al have shown that an increased cct is a risk, fa risk factor for developing a fake or pseudo fake glaucoma and none have shown a preoperative haziness of cornea in cataract it is shown that cct increases much more in children who had surgery at very early age and it has also been shown that a fake children with micro cornea have higher cct and higher measured iop therefore in these cases follow up of cup disc ratio is crucial uh, and Though postoperatively, uh, aphakic and pseudophakic eyes have been shown to have higher CCT, preoperative CCT has not been studied much. Simon et al. have shown a comparison of CCT before and after surgery and followed up to show that CCT increased after surgery and in aphakia much more so than in uh, pseudophakia. Central corneal thickness and corneal haze may be a factor determining the high, high, high IOP which may all predispose to developing glaucoma after cataract surgery. It is good to look at the CCT and uh, corneal clarity and IOP before cataract surgery to closely monitor them postoperatively if necessary and other factors like microphthalmia, early surgery and intraocular infection like rubella have to be taken into consideration. Thank you. Then, uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, Leela, ma'am. Uh, Uh, early identification of refractory error among pediatric patients helps to reduce the incidence of amblyopia, strabismus, and non-strabismic binocular vision anomaly. Our aim is to determine the correlation of occurrence of refractive error among siblings. The areas we focused were, were genetic factors and environmental factor. Background is, uh, when we consider school screening, 10% of the children noted to have refractive error. But whereas in the case of sibling screening, the study conducted in Pondicherry revealed 58.6% of uh, siblings had uh, ocular disorder. So the methodology includes a cross-sectional pilot study uh, done on, uh, in the age group of 0 to 15 years under the project uh, named Systematic Pediatric Eye Care Through Sibling Screening Strategy with the support of SEVA organization USA. We are thankful to them. And uh, what we here did is, uh, children visiting pediatric ophthalmology with refractive error were, who had siblings were enrolled under this project and the de details were collected by the coordinator and counselling of the parents to subject their sibling child were done. And inclusion criteria was, children with refractive error uh, for, uh, fulfilling the following cyclopedic refraction were included. The criteria less than three uh, for less than three years of age was uh, followed by, uh, I mean, we followed American Association of uh, uh, Pediatric Ophthalmology uh, Guidelines revised in 2013. And for older children, we uh, followed one of these criteria that is more than minus 0.5 diopter sphere for in myopia and my, my, more than minus one diopter cylinder in cylinder astigmatism and more than plus one diopter for hypermetropia. Excluded, we have excluded prime, those children primarily having refractive error due to accident or trauma or those children who cannot come for follow-up. After complete ocular examination, refractive error was confirmed with the cycloplegic drops and they were taken into account. And the parents were given questionnaire to fill up about the uh, time of uh, children uh, time spent in, case, in uh, near work, intermediate and distant activity in the basis of uh, hours per weekday, hours per weekend day. And the total hours per week was calculated and uh, based on that average per day is derived. Statistical analysis included mean and standard deviation calculation, percentage analysis and Sapirovic test and Spearman rank cor correlation. Coming to the result, there were 289 probands who had one sibling and 32 probands who had two siblings, more than one sibling. And there were total of 321 probands and 353 siblings. And um, females were majority among them. And the right eye was compared between probands and siblings. So there were, uh, the, for analysis, we were able to take only 301 uh, patients because 15 had a normal right eye uh, refractive status and uh, only refractive error in the left eye. Spherical equivalent, mean spherical equivalent among probands was uh, minus 2 diopter and sibling was minus 0.5 diopter. When we consider the correlation of uh, spherical equivalent among the proband sibling, there was overall positive correlation with, which was statistically significant. When we break into uh, gender-wise uh, 
calculation uh, interestingly same gender brother brother sister sister showed statistically significant correlation whereas brother sister showed did not show uh, such uh, correlation so few other studies have also reported sibling sibling correlation for refractive error the study by young et al where they have studied in terms of gender wise they have brought out that brother brother correlation was lower than sister sister correlation a similar pattern was evident among uh, singapore based study also but that was not statistically significant this is scatter plot of, uh, of our data where the first and second source positive inclination brother brother and sister sister data coming to anisometropia and sibling relationship correlation Uh, even though there was minimal positive correlation it was not statistically significant coming to the correlation of uh, engagement in activities near and outdoor activities there was high highly statistically significant correlation among probands and siblings the similar result was uh, observed by gagan game at all and that is the amount of time spent by proband and sibling were almost same and here is a study by lee et al where they conclude strong association of refractive error among siblings was more than the parent child relationship here they hypothesized that siblings to have possible similar environmental influence than parent and child so what we like to conclude is positive correlation of refractive error among same gender is observed in our study which is statistically significant and siblings share similar environmental factor uh, that is near and distant activities which is again statistically significant hence we conclude correlation of refractive error among siblings is not only influenced by genetic factor but also by environmental factors limitation of the study is it is cross sectional study the amount of correlation the percentage may increase in prospective study which can be considered in future thank you myopia madam myopia yeah both were statistically almost near close by both were statistically significant similar among the students the one study here two study has shown but uh, did you see any difference between these two very very close by values madam just uh, 0.26 and 0.25 uh, uh, yeah both were uh, significant both showed high correlation so i <coughs> i really don't have a question uh, because it's a, a pure epidemiological study there is no there's no question about the methodology it was wonderful i just had a suggestion that you know if the uh, siblings can work out together if an intervention is done on one sibling and not on other sibling maybe that sibling can serve as a case uh, as a control i mean that's just a suggestion sir, i understand uh, there will be lot of other things yeah, but it, this can help in the future yes sir but in our study population only 32 probands had two siblings yeah. all other 298 uh, had only one sibling okay so the practical implication will be when, whenever you see a child with a refractive error you should always call the sibling yes for the yes, uh, refractive uh, uh, is there any correlation between the difference in the age Uh, I mean, versus uh, because two children with uh, similar age or not much of gap yes. will have similar environmental factors versus siblings who are at a different age, yes. a different age group. Uh, so, since it is a cross-sectional study, we didn't uh, do that. We we couldn't adjust for age. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, in number one, yeah, uh, we invite uh, Dr. Arvind Kumar uh, for. good afternoon respected judges and everyone so uh, my study is on posterior fake and trochlear lens for the treatment of refractive amblyopia in the children and adolescent population amblyopia is a neurodevelopmental ocular disease manifested as monocular and binocular impairments including vision reduction contrast sensitivity or even loss of stereoscopic vision commonness of amblyopia is classified as refractive anisometropic and isometropic occlusion therapy has its own drawback and recurrence is seen in 25 to 50% of the cases and contact lenses have the problem of intolerance in this age group so we did a first clinical trial in india and uh, with the highest uh, sample size all over the world by use of fake iols in children and adolescent aged 10 to 19 years of age 
purpose was to analyze the demographics and clinical outcomes of uh, fakic chamber intraocular lens implantation for refractive amblyopia in children and adolescent this was the methodology prospective interventional study on children and adolescent with amblyopia at a tertiary eye care center from january 21 to january 23 23 eyes of 21 n iso myopic and isomyopic amblyopic patients were operated for fakic iol as a treatment for amblyopia patient demographics pre and post op visual acuity cycloplegic refraction anterior and posterior segment examination intraocular pressure pachymetry contrast sensitivity endothelial count stereoscopy and patient satisfaction scores were evaluated patients were followed up uh, till 18 months after surgery and visual outcomes and complications were documented exclusion criteria were patients with hypermetropic amblyopia strabismic amblyopia or with any history of glaucoma active inflammation cataract previous intraocular surgery or any other ocular disease so these were the results so uh, the age was uh, 14.16 plus minus 3.49 years and with 12 were male and the female were 11 so this table is depicting the main and standard deviation of preoperative vision uncorrected to last visit so the, from the log mark 1.39 improved to 0 0.11 at 18 months and when we uh, check the uncorrected vision change from the preoperative to third visit after operation so the mean difference from 1.11 went down to 0 0.05 at the last visit with a significant p value of 0 0.003 gain in terms of visual acuity lines in uncorrected visual acuity and best corrected visual acuity post of visits uh, it improved from 11.3 to 12.1 line the uncorrected visual acuity and the best corrected visual acuity gain was from 1.3 to 2.6 lines. As we compared the contrast sensitivity between the pre-operative and post-operative period, so it also improved 1.07 to 1.66 at 18 months with a significant p-value of 0.01. The IOP was stable, there was no significant p-value difference 15.25 and the last visit 15.29 so there is not much of a difference. Uh, the endothelial loss was 5% as compared to the pre and post op last visit. Patient uh, satisfaction rate in the 23 patients were uh, 21 patients of 23 eyes, uh, and uh, all were very satisfied or extremely satisfied. When we compare the stereo equity measured using the Randot stereo equity using the circle arc second of mean, so it was more plastic to treat and from more than 800 arc second it improved to 150 at the last visit and so finally at the 18 month there was a significant p-value difference so this is the most difficult or plastic and rigid to treat so in conclusion fake IOLs are a good choice for management of amblyopia in children good refractive results with stability and good quality of vision faster visual recovery with flat learning curve and no PI is needed in the newer design Fakic IOLs, but more multicentric clinical trials with long term follow up are needed for results to be more conclusive. And stereopsis, of course, takes longer time to improve. Thank you, thank you so very much. How many, uh, uh, the period of follow up, how many uh, days, 18 months? months? 18, 18 months. months. Yeah. Not more than that. So we need it's to have going, more. Uh, we are still noting all the things. Yeah, because we. You need to have more longer follow up to evaluate. Yeah, we have done 18 months. Mm -hmm. The previous uh, clinical trial that was done uh, in the Korea, so it was done for, for a year. So it is the, the highest uh, follow up period. Which okay. type of a fake IOL did you insert? Which type of a fake IOL? Bi biotech, Icrel. Icrel. Yeah. It has two holes in the... It has three holes, three one holes. center and two... So you don't need to do a PI uh, before... No, it's not needed. Not and there was, uh, as, as seen uh, in the IOP table... Yeah. Can you play it again? No, no, we remember. No. So 15.25 was the pre-op average. And 15.25 at the last follow-up. So there is not much of a difference. Uh, but yeah, yeah. Uh, one, one question. Uh, do we need to do a, a contact lens trial before doing a fake eye Yeah, check? it was done. It, it was, was done. done. I mean, that will help was also it. done, and okay. contact lens trial was also done. Okay. But when the patient failed, then we included into this group. Just two, three questions. One is whether we did a pinhole pre-op, pinhole vision. 
Yeah, yeah, pinhole vision. But pinhole vision was also not improving. No, in amblyopia it doesn't uh, improve. Okay. Yeah. No, no, <laughs> not. So, Generally, so how does how does faking eye will improve amblyopia mm-hmm. if that is the uh, correlation that in pinhole? Because uh, it is more closer to the nodal point, and there are uh, least fracture area as we come. Anything we are doing uh, anterior to cornea, so there is a problem. No, no, I am talking about pinhole, uh, not a pro- Okay, was higher order abrasion measured in these patients? Mm. No. So then it is very difficult to uh-huh. say that whether it was improving higher order abrasions or not. Yeah, definitely. Uh, that, that is a very important point. Hmm. Second thing is that uh, as Madam was asking about the follow-up, probably she what, what she probably meant was mm. uh, the axial growth of the eyeball. So uh, was any peripheral hyperopic uh, refraction noted or whether any peripheral uh, refraction noted that these patients would go for uh, you know, myopic progression into We only days. included those patients in which the this was stable, refractive, uh, the status was stable for at least a year. But only the age was uh, 10 to 19 Yeah, years. because by that time, uh, the uh, axial length, the growth of the eyeball is almost done. Not but in myopic eyes. Yeah. 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 Not in still. myopic eyes. It does not stop in myopic patients. Yeah. But yeah, in but your patient, it had stopped. That is what you said. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, as uh, the uh, the follow up is almost two years now, and the uh, refractive error uh, average is plus minus zero point five zero only in all Wonderful. the patients. Wonderful. So it is a very good sign. No, oh, because uh, we expect a sudden jump in the refractive yeah, yeah. at the age of thirteen or fourteen years, and your ten. age group is between ten to nineteen. So yeah. it is the uh, the refractive status will definitely change. Yeah, after two years, what I'm saying, maybe. Yeah. We'll so come it's up with the new plus yeah. minus 0.40 uh, only. Yeah, that's at two years. Wonderful. Yeah. Congratulations. Yeah. Was this published in IGF? Yeah. Two uh, months back. Yeah, yeah. Good. Yeah. Wonderful. Okay. So, thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Arvind. Now we invite uh, Dr. Rakshita Kine for her uh, free paper. Dr. Rakshita. It's on coincidental ocular anomalies in telescreening of retinopathy of prematurity during COVID pandemic. Good evening all. I'll be presenting coincidental ocular anomalies found in telescreening of retinopathy of prematurity conducted during the COVID pandemic. So, ROP telescreening is an essential newborn service by Government of India under Rashtriya Bal Swasthya Karyakram. Despite shortage of ROP specialists, Telemedicine-based uh, outreach screening pro- ROP program is well established with the help of wide-field camera-based digital imaging with, uh, in suburban and rural neonatal care units. There are studies showing usage of digital fundus imaging to assess non-ROP ocular anomalies. These were the studies of Jayadev et al., Liu et al., and Ranjan et al. So, COVID-19 pandemic disrupted the ophthalmic care and ROP screening across the country due to the cessation of public transport and other restrictions. In this study, we report the magnitude and spectrum of non-ROP findings including referral warranted ocular pathologies detected during ROP telescreening program from January 2020 to December 2021. So it's a retrospective study where where ROP telescreening was done in neonatal care units of Kerala and Tamil Nadu in children with gestational age of less than 36 weeks and birth weight less than 2 kgs. Babies born after 36 weeks were also screened if requested by neonatologists. Images were obtained according to ROP telescreening protocol, one dilated anterior segment image and at least five fundus images covering posterior port and four quadrants were obtained by uh, well-trained technicians with the help of Red cam shuttle. So, total 10,670 sessions were carried out, 4,718 babies were screened, 264 eyes of 140 babies had non ROP findings, and 20.7% among them had referral warranted pathologies. Uh, so, out of 2.9% of babies had non ROP finding, 10% were unilateral, 90% were bilateral. 92.1% had posterior segment pathology and 7.8% had anterior segment pathology. 20.7% had referral warranted pathologies. 48.2% children had hospital based evaluation. Uh, su- surgical intervention was done in two babies uh, and three babies were managed medically and three babies uh, were managed uh, with, with, with visual rehabilitation. So, total 158 eyes of 129 babies uh, had posterior segment pathologies. Uh, among them, hemorrhages was the most common finding. Two babies had intraocular mass, four babies had posterior uveitis, and one baby had endogenous endophthalmitis. 
Hemorrhages was the most common finding and none of the baby in our study had significant hematological abnormality. Most of the hemorrhages were self-resolving. Uh, dense vitreous hemorrhages or premacular hemorrhages were referred to higher center for further management. Four babies were referred. Two of them came for follow-up. As the hemorrhages were resolving, nil intervention was done. There were five babies who were suspected case of posterior uveitis. One of them was diagnosed as a case of endogenous endophthalmitis and was treated under the supervision of neonatologist. Other four babies consulted a nearby private hospital. Two babies were diagnosed as a case of retinoblastoma and treated with intravenous chemotherapy and transpupillary thermotherapy. Presently, they are on follow-up at base hospital. It is the most, second most common ocular finding which required immediate referral and management. Other posterior segment findings included retinochoroidal coloboma and albinotic fundus. Total 18, baby, uh, 18 eyes of 12 babies had anterior segment pathologies. Most common was congenital cataract. One baby had microcornea, three had corneal opacity, one with iris coloboma, and one baby had microphthalmos. So congenital cataract was the most common non-ROP finding which required referral and surgical intervention similar to many other studies. Hospital-based evaluation showed visually significant cataract in 57%. Three babies were lost to follow-up. Cataract surgery was performed in two babies and two babies failed to follow up for surgery. There were five cases of congenital corneal opacity. One of them was a case of Peter's anomaly. The baby was started on anti-glaucoma medication and is being followed up regularly. Coming on to discussion, telescreening program has enabled digital imaging of both anterior and posterior segments, early detection of pathology, successful cross consultation and appropriate management of multiple diseases by relevant specialists. So this is a table showing incidence of non-ROP findings in our study versus other study. In our study, it was 2.96% in two years. In Ranjan et al. study, it was 4.2% in 4.5 years. In Jayadev et al. study, it was 7.6% in one year. So during COVID pandemic, many babies were lost to follow up and probably took treatment at another center closer to home. So despite being retrospective, this is one of the few study to screen non-ROP ocular finding during the COVID pandemic. Thus, I conclude, with the help of telescreening, we can diagnose sight-threatening as well as life-threatening pathologies. Based on the results of our study, we strongly opine to screen non-ROP pathologies along with ROP screening, irrespective of the gestational age of the baby. Since the visual symptoms in ba uh, babies would only be identified later in life due to their inability to express, telescreening should be adopted as a part of routine neonatal care. Thank you. Uh, one or two things uh, I want to clarify. So, uh, which setup? Uh, if you do a screening in a NI setup, NICO yeah, yes. setup, yes, or a general baby's uh, setup. NICU. So the finding. So this uh, study was done in a NICU setup. NICU setup in Kerala and Tamil Nadu hospitals. Oh, all all NICUs, all the babies. Okay, fine. So, what was different about uh, pandemic? Like, uh, why uh, you are referring to as a pandemic uh, associated? Uh, because uh, not associated, ma'am. We just noticed that the follow-up rate was very less. Like uh, cataract surgery, also there were seven babies with cataract. We could only get four babies for follow-up in hospital, and out of them, also only two babies underwent surgery. So, follow-up was the problem. One thing. Other thing is. Uh, Telescreening that time was uh, reduced because of the COVID restriction, uh, because of the risk of infection transmission. So uh, those were the two points which were But different. still, uh, during the pandemic, uh, screening where Screening being was done. there, ma'am. But uh, screening was less. being done was because uh, all NSUs had preterm babies and they had to be screened. Yeah. So n nothing special uh, in during that time, I think. All the babies who needed screening, they had to be screened at any cost okay yeah. so so these are the findings which you normally f uh, have in a nicu setup but if you have a broad population uh, screening then you won't see uh, uh, so you should mention whether the screening was a nicu based uh, screening because the findings will differ okay yeah. if it is a hospital based screening or a general baby screening thank you just one question. Uh, this was published in Ophthalmic Clinics 2020. Oh. Yes. Okay. Now we invite uh, uh, Dr. Shalini Gupta. She uh, will be presenting on Dr. Shalini. She is there. Okay. Next, uh, Dr. Simar Ranjan Singh. 
Okay, he'll be presenting on multimodal imaging characteristics and genetic profile of achromatopsia in a North Indian cohort. Uh, thank you so much, sir. So I'll be presenting on achromatopsia. Achromatopsia is a relatively rare genetic disorder, which is caused due to total loss of cone function in the retina. Traditionally, it has been described as a stationary disorder with a reported prevalence of about 1 in 30,000. It is a genetic disorder with six genes that have been described to cause it, out of which CNG A3 and the CNG B3, which are the cyclic nucleotide channel, uh, gated channel genes, which guard that channel are the most common causes. They cause up to 90% of the cases. And the Western literature reports CNG B3 as the most common cause, while the Middle East and China report CNG A3. And there is absolutely no data from achromatopsia from India and it is an underdiagnosed cause of childhood blindness in India. So the purpose of our study was to describe the clinical features, multimodal imaging characteristics, genetic profile of patients of achromatopsia in a North Indian cohort. It was a cross-sectional analysis of genetically proven achromatopsia patients presenting to our retinal dystrophy service from July 2021 to December 2022. Diagnosis was based on the correlation of presenting complaints, clinical examination, visual acuity, color vision and fundus examination, multimodal imaging including color photo fundus photograph, fundus autofluorescence and swept source OCT. Full field electroretinogram and genetic testing which included clinical exome followed by confirmation with Sanger sequencing. This was the case which actually developed our interest uh, first of all and was seen that came to us at the age of three months brought by parents with complaints of child unable to open the eyes in when the child was taken outside and nystagmus and that time a lot of investigations were done queries uh, cortical visual impairment nothing could be found at that time posterior segment also seen reported normal Seen at one year, the nystagmus was decreasing, but still no diagnosis. Three years, again the same. Cardiff visual acuity was about 624 and 660 in both the eyes. And the nystagmus was continuously decreasing. It was at four years of age when we actually saw the child in the dystrophy clinic. Child complained of photophobia himself. And color vision could also be recorded at that time when the child could only read the demo plates in both the eyes. So this is the, these are the videos of the child and you can see very uh, what we call as hamarlopia or day blindness, severely sensitive to bright light. And the upper video is actually not showing here properly, which shows the nystagmus that was present in the child. So coming on to the imaging of this child, this is the wide field optos photograph, which once you would see with an indirect, it is essentially looks normal. And even if you see it closely zoomed up into the posterior pole, it looks normal. You won't find any pathology. But once you do an autofluorescence on this patient, you can recognize this hyper-autofluorescent hyper ring that is just surrounding the fovea in both the eyes. So this was a definite clue that something is going on. And if you look at the OCT scans, which we could do, which are difficult to do in these children due to nystagmus, but you can see that optically empty zone at the posterior pole, which signifies that there are some photoreceptors that are missing. Electrophysiology helps you tell which photoreceptors are involved. Dark adapted, uh, dim flash and bright flash both showed good waveforms, signals coming, while the light adapted waveforms were almost flat, which signified that the cone system was not functioning in the child. The genetics confirmed our diagnosis with a compound heterozygous pathogenic mutation of a CNG B3 gene, which was further confirmed with Sanger sequencing and parental segregation. So overall our results we had 22, since then we have had 22 patients, 44 eyes of genetically proven achromatopsia, 13 females, 9 males, 3 pairs of siblings. Average age of presentation is around 7 to 8 years with the youngest child that we have diagnosed is now 3 months of age. And the average age at diagnosis initially was larger because we were not picking up these children but now since we have started recognizing the signs, we are picking them up early when they come to us. Majority of the draining area was from our surrounding centers in PGI, Chandigarh, Punjab, Haryana, Punjab contributed the most. Hemarlopia and nystagmus were the most common features. Low vision was not a feature, but day blindness, child not opening the eyes in bright light and nystagmus. And majority of the children, 20, 18 children whom we could record visual acuity by various methods had moderate visual loss. The genetic profile was completely reversed to what the West has reported with majority 86 presenting with a CNG A3 mutation compared to CNG B3 that has been reported. So that was a major difference. So you can see the fundus, variable fundus changes from a very normal looking fundus to some amount of hyperpigmentation at the posterior pole and a frank atrophy. 
So 50% of the eyes had fundus changes and autofluorescence could pick up more changes and 83% of the eye has autofluorescence changes which could be simple as some hyper autofluorescence, a ring of hyper autofluorescence or complete hypo autofluorescence. The OCT had a very characteristic stage like manner and you can see these ages that I have put up of the children. So the first stage there was just a small defect and flattening of the ellipsoid zone. The next stage there was a proper gap that could be seen in the outer cone photoreceptors. The third stage there was an optically empty space, the gap was widened. The fourth 4A you could see some RP atrophy and hypertransmission. 4B that gap flattened down, the layer sat down. And stage 5, there was complete atrophy. And this was progressive as the age of the children was increasing, as is evident here. But the visual acuity was not. Visual acuity was similar in all these children. The treatment that we gave mostly was refractive correction, tinted or, or contact glasses or contact lenses and counseling. The future does hold uh, good things for us as there are at least five clinical trials that are going on with three of them now getting published also reporting data that as to some efficacy and at least the safety of these. So early onset nystagmus getting better with age and hemarlopia may be the first signs of achromatopsia. We need to keep a high index of suspicion and look out for these signs and order relevant imaging, electrophysiology and genetic testing. Fundus imaging, multimodal imaging, all of them combined together give us the best chance to pick up these children. And preserved cones in the initial stages as shown on OCT could be a predictor of better targets for gene therapy which is just on the horizon and we need more data for that from our country to, to go forward. Thank you. Let's say we need all the three combinations. Suppose we don't have autofluorescence. Can we pick up with this two OCT no, absolutely. and... Absolutely. Because they are very uncooperative children. Mm. They are very hemarlopic. They are very uh, resistant to bright light. Mm. So examination mm. is difficult. Optos helps since it's a laser light. The flash is less. The child cooperates more. Mm -hmm. So zooming up on that, I have started picking up that hyperpigmented ring over there in these children and started seeing on examination also now. But that has come with some experience. Mm -hmm. Earlier, we used to just label them as normal fundus and nothing in the fundus. So they were just going round and round in the pediatric ophthalmology clinic, undiagnosed, getting multiple investigations, MRIs. But when we combine the three modalities, at least one of them would give us a clue as to something is abnormal. The OCT sometimes may not pass through exactly that, but repeating that maybe after three to six months, sometimes you will get that clue and then you can proceed with further electrophysiology and genetic testing based on that. But I think you yeah. pick up most of the tests. Yes, sir. But then again, in the younger children, that's a challenge doing a ERG in some of them because they would they would present at three months of age, nine. We can do it, sir. But then again, that's a little bit of a challenge, and it may not be very reliable. Also, but once you pick up these signs and you combine all of them, you can definitely make a diagnosis. Nice. So basically, what we do in our clinic is if patient has photophobia, like yes, sir. We do an ERG and we do a UA and see the fundus and do the yeah. So that is how we absolutely. think that we catch most of them. But you are absolutely right because if ERG is not there and if general anesthesia facilities are not there, then yes, fundus sir. is normal and it will keep on moving in the yeah. city. Yes, sir. So, so, so that is a good insight. You slowly we are trying to differentiate because some of the cone rod dystrophies also may present yeah. like that. Yeah. This is pure cone yeah. dystrophy. Yeah. But slowly we are seeing that the fundus findings and the autofluorescence findings are much wider in the cone rod cohort than in the cone dystrophy or achromatopsia, which is very limited to the foveal area rather than the posterior pole or till the arcade area. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you ma'am. Uh, we now invite uh, Dr. Priya Goel. Uh, she will be presenting on accuracy of IOL power calculation in pediatric traumatic cataract. A very good morning to the judges and to the audience. So I, today be, I'll be presenting the paper on the topic of accuracy of IOL power calculation in pediatric traumatic cataract. Uh, management of pediatric traumatic cataract is, is itself a very challenging task in terms of timing of the surgery, anterior segment and posterior segment associated trauma, inability to implant the IOL in the bag or in the eye altogether, and also the post-operative visual rehabilitation. So uh, the main aspect or regarding the pediatric cataract management is basically the IOL power calculation and the post-operative prediction error. 
so basically after trauma there is a, a corneal damage in terms of corneal tear or the associated scar and also there is excellent change uh, maybe immediately or maybe after the uh, trauma maybe few months later due to the asymmetric eyeball growth and both these are the most important factors which affect the eyeball power calculation and any errors in the measurement of these factors can lead to uh, high prediction errors which can in turn cause amblyogenic anisometropia and complicated visual rehabilitation post operatively however we have a lot of evidence in the literature regarding the visual outcomes following the pediatric traumatic cataract management and also the factors affecting the poor vision but the accuracy of eyeball power calculation has not been studied in any papers most of the studies have excluded the uh, history of trauma that's why it becomes more important to study so the aim of the study was to evaluate the absolute prediction error in pediatric traumatic cataract and the factors affecting it and secondarily to compare the prediction error using keratometry of the fellow eye and also the standard k value in the eyes with the corneal scar it was a retrospective study which was conducted from february 2019 to march 2022 with a duration of 2 years and uh, the data was collected from the emr system the inclusion criteria was age uh, less than or equal to 16 years with the eyes having unilateral traumatic cataract where eyeball implantation was done at the study center any other cause uh, of cataract uh, apart from the trauma was excluded and any pre existing ocular problem or associated posterior segment involvement or glaucoma was excluded and also if after the cataract surgery i was left fak that was also excluded any children with incomplete data or loss to follow were also excluded the data was collected uh, in terms of the details of the surgery and the details of the injury and all the examination details eyeball power calculation method was either used uh, optical method in uh, children who were which in children who were cooperative and in non cooperative children contact ultrasound biometry with handheld keratometer was done under general anesthesia eyeball power calculation formula which was used was srk t in children less than 2 years of age and also in axial length less than 22 mm and rest of them were uh, SRK2 was used. Age specific under correction using NID's formula was done. The target refraction was calculated by deducting the implanted IOL power from the calculated IOL power and the final refractive error was measured at 6 weeks after the cataract surgery only after performing the su suture removal. The formula which was used was uh, absolute prediction error uh, was target refraction minus the observed refraction. also in eyes with the corneal scar just to see the effect of uh, corneal presence of scar uh, affecting the prediction error we calculated a simulated prediction error uh, by using the average k of the fellow eye and also the standard k value of the 44 diopters and then this simulated prediction error was compared with the absolute prediction error uh, when compared when uh, a keratometry of the affected eye was used the data uh, analysis so prediction error was categorized into three categories and all these factors uh, including the parametric and the non parametric data of the affected eye at different categories of the prediction error were compared and appropriate statistical tests were applied so uh, out of the whole data 132 children were uh, seen to have uh, unilateral pediatric traumatic cataract but the children who met the inclusion criteria were only 50 which were included for the final analysis the mean age at surgery was 9.47 years and only two children were having age less than 2 years and uh, there was a male preponderance uh 38 eyes had more worse uh, visual acuity worse than 6 by 60 uh, 22 eyes were having open globe injuries and 28 were having closed globe injuries primary globe repair was required in 15 children the presence of scar was seen in 34 eyes and out of which the visual axis was involved in only 16 eyes cataract surgery was performed within 6 weeks of uh, trauma or the repair and rest were having surgery later on uh primary eye implantation was done in 40 eyes and secondary eye implantation was done in 10 eyes with an average duration of 4.3 months after the cataract surgery ppc and vitrectomy was required as per the age uh, less than 6 years or if there was a pre existing defect or the capsular plaque at the pc the prediction error values uh, were ranging from plus 3.5 diopters to minus 9 diopters with a mean value of 1.63 there was no prediction error seen in five eyes and highest prediction error was seen in youngest children with the age of 2 years and uh, there was overestimation of the eye power calculation in 35 eyes with a mean value of 1.6 diopters and underestimation was seen in 10 eyes with a mean value of 1.07 there was no statistically significant difference between the mean axial length of the affected eye and the fellow eye also not significant difference between the average k of the two eyes 
the following factors were uh, studied to see if there is an effect on the prediction error. So there was no significant p-value seen in age, status of primary repair, type of IOL implantation, or the position of IOL, or whether AV or PPC done or not, or, uh, or due to the method of excellent measurement, or the presence of corneal scar, or the keratometry values. The only significant p-value was found in the preoperative axial length and we can see in this scatter plot graph that as the, uh, there is a lesser smaller axial length there was a higher prediction error seen also in the eyes with the corneal scar we could uh, we measured the uh, absolute prediction error of the affected eye and we compared it with the simulated prediction error of the fellow eye as well as the standard k values we could not find any statistically significant difference just on the basis of presence of scar but however when the scar was involving the central visual axis then we could see that high prediction error was seen with the values of keratometry of standard uh, 44 diopters and uh, the when compared with when uh, compared with the uh, simulated prediction error using the uh, fellow eye there was no significant difference there were similar values can you uh, conclude because the time yes sir so uh, the range of the prediction error which was seen in our study was similar to the other studies also in the literature and also we uh, there has been evidence in the literature that less than two years of children have higher prediction errors ranging from 0 to 21 diopters which was seen in our study as well and most of them have correlated it with the shorter axial length which was seen in our study as well. So the possible reasons we could, which we could find uh, was basically mainly because of the errors in the measure of measurement of axial length because we used contact biometry instead of immersion technique and immersion technique causes uh, uh, measurement of axial length little higher than the contact method. So there will be, uh, probably there was an overestimation in our study because of that. So the strengths of our study was uh, there is no similar study and this is the only study to exclusively evaluate the prediction error in traumatic pediatric cataract. Most of the studies have excluded it. The main limitation of the study is basically its retrospective design. There was few of data which was lost to follow up and we could not find the complete data. Multiple examiners performing the biometry and the multiple surgeons were involved. However, we could not adjust these factors to analyze their effect on prediction error. Um, so to conclude, the current study analyzed the prediction error exclusively in pediatric chromatic cataract surgery with IL implantation. We found that the absolute prediction error in such cases were higher than the reported literature for non-traumatic pediatric cataracts within the same age group. The axial length of the affected eye was the only parameter significantly seen to affect the prediction error. And finally, in cases where corneal scar precludes the keratometry, probably the fellow eye keratometry can be used. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh Actually, during my fellowship, I had presented a similar paper, but it was not on. We did not include a traumatic attack. So, as regards the results, we were very similar as far as the age and the axial length. With the lesser the axial length, lesser the age, the prediction error is much more. So, I mean, results are quite similar. Uh, did you? Uh, I mean, try to analyze the absolute absolute prediction error. Uh, with the duration of uh, uh, between yes. trauma and surgery. Yes, sir. It was not significant. However, the uh, longer the duration, we could see higher the prediction errors, but the difference was not statistically significant. All your, all your cases, uh, traumatic cataract yeah. had a corneal uh, scar. No, ma'am. Only thirty-five the eyes. So, uh, so you are. So we have uh, overall studied the prediction error in all the fifty children, which was the sample. And also, especially in the eyes with the corneal scar, we have separately an analyzed them. So we have calculated simulated prediction error only for those yeah, eyes. Yeah, yeah, you have yes. to separate those. Yes, yes. And you did a contact biometry yes. in all these cases. Yes. That is only in the idea. uncooperative children. In thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'd like to invite our next speaker, Dr. Nikita Gupta. She will be presenting on structural, biometric, and refractive outcomes of two treatment strategies in Zone 1 ROP. Good evening, everyone. So as we all know that ROP in Zone 1 is a distinct entity which is more susceptible to adverse structure. Sorry. So as we all know that ROP in Zone... The timer is on. ROP in Zone 1 is a distinct entity uh, as it is more susceptible to, uh, susceptible to adverse structural and functional outcomes. Uh, landmark studies like ETROP and cryo-ROP had only uh, less than 50% of their study population in zone 1 and they also that laser is the standard of care. However, poorer outcomes were seen in zone 1 compared to zone 2. Uh, studies like beta-ROP and rainbow also showed success with uh, bevacizumab and ranip 
ranibizumab however there is limited literature about the outcomes of uh, treatment modalities in zone 1 rop with majority studies either not including or reporting outcomes in aggressive rop and uh, also not reporting uh, not including uh, babies with heavier birth weights reports on biometric parameters and refractive outcomes with regards to difference in uh, treatment strategy strategy that is laser and anti vegf is also inconclusive so we studied the structural and uh, refractive outcomes of intravitreal ranibizumab and laser in zone 1 rop we included all infants screened as per rbsk guidelines who had the uh, treatment requiring disease in zone 1 and excluded infants with congenital systemic or ocular abnormality uh, infants with media uh, problems with media clarity and previously treated rop We did a baseline dead cam fundus photo of both the eyes of all the infants. Axial length was measured using A scan biometry. Retinoscope cycloplegic retinoscopy was done, and keratometry lens thickness and anterior chamber depths were measured by swaddling the baby in a horizontal position on the ASOCT machine. The keratometry and uh, ACD values were obtained uh, using the uh, topography map, and the lens thickness um, was measured uh, with, uh, manually by dropping a caliper from the anterior to the posterior lens surface. Infants were randomized into two groups, that is, double frequency NDAG laser and intravitreal ranibizumab, 0.25 milligram in both the eyes. In case of recurrence in the laser group, retreatment was done with laser photocoagulation. However, in the ranibizumab group, retreatment was done with the intravitreal ranibizumab after a minimum interval of 28 days. The primary outcome was to see the percentage of eyes with regression of disease, those with unfavorable structural outcomes, and those with recurrence of ROP. The secondary outcome was to note the change in baseline uh, from uh, the change in uh, biometric and re retinoscopy values at three, six, and twelve months after receiving treatment. Coming to the observation and results, the demographic profile was similar in the two groups. The risk factors were also similar in the two groups. However, the mean birth weight was slightly higher in the ranibizumab group. and the majority of the infants had birth weights between 1100 to 1500 grams the baseline character characteristics with regard to the type of rop and the zone of disease was also similar in the two groups out of the 36 eyes which received laser 28 eyes were evaluated at the end of 3 months and we saw that no additional treatment was required in 93% of the eyes uh, that uh, who underwent laser and two of the eyes had unfavorable structural outcome in the 30 eyes evaluated in the ranibizumab group Less than 50% of the eyes required no additional treatment, and one third of the cohort had a recurrence of plus and subsequently received laser and uh, ranibizumab or laser if there was a presence of FVP. Three eyes had unfavorable structural outcome and two eyes developed cataract. Majority of the eyes in both the groups had regression between two to three weeks following uh, treatment. In the ranibizumab group, the postmenstrual age at the time of recurrence was uh, majorly lied in the uh, uh, age in the postmenstrual age of 39 to 41 weeks. At six months, we evaluated the uh, ranibizumab treated eyes, and we saw in the 22 uh, eyes which received ranibizumab and had no uh, uh, and did not underwent laser or had unfavorable structural outcomes. Only less than two uh, less than uh, two eyes had uh, vascularization still limited to zone two posterior. We also did an angiography of uh, for 20 eyes in the ranibizumab group, and we saw that six eyes still had a uh, temporal or vascular retina even after receiving two intravitreal ranibizumab, and uh, eight eyes had temporal or vascular retina with presence of leakage. Four eyes had temporal or vascular retina, uh, but they did not have any leakage. Uh, so this is one infant with the uh, uh, born at 32 weeks post uh, period of gestation with the uh, AR aggressive ROP in zone one at presentation. Who received an intravitreal ranibizumab, and at the end of six months, when we did an angiography, we saw that the, the vascularization had uh, progressed to zone two anterior. However, there was still presence of a vascular retina. In another infant with aggressive ROP at uh, uh, presentation in zone one, even after receiving two intravitreal ranibizumab, when the angiography was done, it showed a vascular retina with presence of leakage, and the child underwent subsequent laser. Coming to the biometric profile, the axial lengths showed an increasing trend in both the groups. However, the axial lengths were higher in the uh, ranibizumab treated eyes compared to laser at the end of three and six months. The lenses were significantly thicker in the laser treated eyes at the end of six months as well as one year compared to the ranibizumab group. The anterior chambers were also shallower in the laser treated eyes at the end of three and six months. However, the difference was not significant at one year. The keratometry uh, graph showed that the uh, Uh, laser treated eyes had a steeper cornea than the uh, ranibizumab group at the end of one year this is the tabulated form we can, we can see at the end of one year the lenses were thicker in the laser treated eyes and the uh, keratometry was steeper in the laser treated eyes compared to the ranibizumab group however there was no difference in spherical equivalent at any of uh, the uh, end point as well as at baseline and the distribution of refractive errors was also similar in the two groups at baseline as well as at the end of one year so the success rate of single treatment that is laser in zone 1 rop was 93% in our study uh, with versus 47% with ranibizumab at the end of 3 months however we see the overall success rate that it was 
with ranizumab it was 73% and these overall success treatment success rate was only slightly higher with laser group compared to the ranizumab group however there was no difference in refractive outcomes between the two groups at the end of 12 months so to conclude laser photocoagulation does show comparable anatomical outcomes to intravitreal ranizumab in zone 1 rop however it caused more changes in biometric parameters especially lens thickness and anti-vegetative injections are a good option for zone 1 rop uh, and they allow the retinal vessels to grow and eliminate the side effects of ablating these large areas of retina in zone 1 however though differing uh, laser by intravitreal ranizumab seemed to outdo the development of some of the biometric changes refractive errors were still comparable between the two group at one year thus implying that zone of disease also contributes to myopia and rop thank you uh, if you do a laser uh in ROP then uh, those eyes will go become myopic in future so your follow up is just for 12 months no one year yes ma'am okay so you need to when you follow up these children uh, uh, later in their life most of them land up in myopia so ma'am is getting even, laser yes ma'am but in our in our study showed that even ranizumab treated eyes had similar refractive outcomes at the end of one year but the, your follow up uh, period yes. is too less yeah. you cannot conclude in on that yes ma'am you cannot conclude then that perhaps the myopia is curvature myopia yes, it is related it is to the lenticular myopia it is not axial myopia yeah. the lenses were thicker and the anterior chambers were shallower in the laser treated eyes so how do you decide which eye to do a laser in zone 1 usually zone 1 laser is uh, like we avoid doing lasers in zone 1 rop and in our study we yeah, how do you how did you decide the my zine pens so whoever had the zone 1 treatment requiring rop we randomized them and uh, then we randomized them to laser and ranizumab group and then we followed up it was not need based you sorry sir it was not need based no we randomized prospectively oh, regardless of whether it was uh, i mean whether it needed anti wedge if you still went for laser as yes sir Oh. So that is <laughs> that is one I thing mean, which for do. for an infant it is difficult. So this was so a prospective that, study. Sorry, sir, it's this a prospective was, study. So you got the ethical approval to randomize. Yes, yes, yes you sir. need a ethical. Uh, we we did approval for it. it. They got it. Wonderful. So we also show that at the end of one year, like laser. Huh? Laser. No, no, but see, if there is zone one ROP zone and one. if you have plus disease. You may, you know, it is not proper to see. We all know that standard of care is laser. There is no doubt about it. But you may have to give anti wedge if you can't randomize it. Uh, that you know, because we are doing a study to find out the biometric parameters. The patient has been randomized, and patient should receive a laser because we want to follow them up, thinking that what structure. That, that is like an ethical issue, actually. No, but they got ethical approval. Did we combination treatment for any of them? No. What? Okay. We excluded those. Right. And in fact, at the end of one, we well, in at the end of three months, we did show that laser had a slightly higher success treatment success compared to ranizumab, at least in alcohol. In terms of success, in terms of field. In terms success of in terms of ROP. No, no regression. <laughs> no, no. Anatomical but if you see, if you laser. If you laser the whole zone two and zone three, you're going to get a better, uh, you know, success. That doesn't mean that anti vegf doesn't stand a better chance in terms of visual field. Your know, success has different parameters. What parameters we are talking about? That is what I was asking. In terms of the anatomical success, sir. Yeah, fair enough. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Nikita. Now we invite uh, Dr. Uh, Neha Shilpi. She is not coming. Okay. Uh, one more we had absent here. We will just announce if she is coming. Dr. Shalini Gupta is there? No. Okay. Uh, so with this, I think we have finished this session, but uh, we have a semi-finalist from the previous session who... Dr. Vibha Badrinath. She is the semi finalist from the previous uh, session. Her, the topic is IOL formula calculation in pediatric eyes. Do we have an answer? So, please load the presentation. Okay, doctor, you can start, please. Good afternoon, everyone. So, today I'll be presenting a free paper titled IOL formula calculation in pediatric eyes. Do we have an answer? 
no financial disclosures. Pediatric cataract surgery with intraocular lens implantation is a very commonly performed procedure worldwide. But in children, there are some challenges in the IOL power calculation. Some of them are the axial eyeball growth and the tendency for myopic shift because of which we need to do a targeted hyperopic undercorrection, poor cooperation for measurement in children, and so the measurements are usually done under general anesthesia, where fixation and centration is usually a problem. And also, the commonly used IOL power calculation formulae are validated only in adult eyes. So the aim of our study was to assess the predictability of SRK2 and Barrett's Universal 2 formula and the possible effect of axillin, keratometry, and age. It was a retrospective study. Total of 123 records were analyzed and 72 eyes of 39 patients were included. Children under 8 years of age who underwent cataract surgery with IOL implantation were included, but uh, children who also had other ocular anomalies or other ocular disorders were excluded. So the IOL power was calculated according to SRK2 using the age-appropriate target hyperopic undercorrection given by NAD et al. And after the surgery at post-op one month, the refraction was done and the spherical equivalent was calculated. So the prediction error according to SRK2 was calculated as the difference between this post-op spherical equivalent and the target refraction. Uh, then the IOL power was calculated according to Barrett's using the same target refraction and the post-op spherical equivalent was back calculated. So the prediction error according to Barrett's was the back calculated spherical equivalent minus the target refraction. So mean prediction error and mean absolute prediction error when both the groups were compared and further subgroup analysis was done for axillin, keratometry, and age. The statistical analysis was performed using SPSS version 21, and the difference in the predicted error and absolute predicted error between the two formulae was analyzed by Wilcoxon sign rank test. P-value of less than 0.05 was considered statistically significant. So coming to the results, total of 72 eyes of 39 patients were included. The mean age of surgery was around 3.8 years. In the overall cohort, we can see that the mean predictive error for Barrett's was much lesser compared to SRK2, and this value was statistically significant. But there was no major difference between the mean absolute predictive error in the two groups. Further, according to subgroup analysis, according to axial length, the cohort was divided into three groups. In the 18 to 21 mm axial length group, SRK2 performed much better than Barrett's, but in the 21 to 24 mm group, Barrett's had a much lesser predictive and an absolute predictive error compared to SRK2. But in the higher axial lengths, both these IOL formulae gave a higher predictive error. In the correlation analysis, a strong positive correlation was seen uh, with the predictive error using the SRK2 for the higher axial lengths. So the subgroup analysis was then done according to keratometry. It was divided into two groups. In the a group which had less than or equal to 45 diopters keratometry. Barrett's had a much better predictive error compared to SRK2, but in the higher uh, steeper corneas, both of them were almost comparable. And there was a significant negative correlation in the overall keratometry group using Barrett's. Subgroup analysis was then done according to age and it was divided into three groups. In these three groups, overall Barrett performed much better compared to SRK2 and the least predictive error was seen in the less than or equal to two years age group and after that in the beyond five years age group. No significant correlation was found for this. So in our study, overall Barrett's had a lower mean predictive error as compared to SRK2 and this value was statistically significant, but the mean absolute predictive error was similar in both. With respect to axial length in the 18 to 21 mm, SRK2 performed better. In the 21 to 24 mm, Barrett's performed better, but in the higher axial length group, both had an equal predictive error. For the steeper corneas, SRK2 and Barrett's were comparable, but in the flatter corneas, Barrett's had more predictable outcomes. And Barrett's had a smaller prediction error across all the subgroups of age, especially less than two years. So when we compared our study with other similar studies that have been done, we can see that there's no single IOL power calculation formula that has been given by any study. Chang et al. said that Barrett's performed actually better in the higher axial lengths and in children more than two years of age. Epley et al. said Barrett's performed equally well in all the, across all the age groups, all the axial lengths and all keratometries. But Kekunaya et al. actually found that SRK2 had the least predictive error across all the groups. So in conclusion, from our study, we can say that Barrett's can be used with predictable outcomes in children less than two years of age and above five years, eyes with axial length between 21 to 24 mm, and flatter corneas less than 45 diopters. Thank you.
Thank you. Uh, can you go back to the conclusion slide, please? Okay. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, okay, so I think uh, with this we'll uh, uh, we have reached the uh, end of the session. I would request all the speakers to please stay back. We'll have a group photo. Uh, we have a photographer with us, or or we can use our mobiles. Yeah.